So welcome everybody. We're gonna talk today about shoulder pain, some common causes for shoulder pain, and then also some treatment options. We'll keep it very informal. Uh, if there's any questions, just raise your hand um, and we'll, we'll answer any questions as we go along here. Thanks for coming and thanks for, for tuning in, whoever's on virtually. So a little bit about myself. Um, you know, I grew up uh, in a small town in southeast Michigan, just outside of Detroit. Um, that's where I was born and raised. I went to college at the University of Michigan. Uh, after that, went on to do my medical training and medical degree at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland. Uh, and then went on to do an orthopedic surgery fellowship at the University of Chicago, uh, on the south side of Chicago. Um, and then did some subspecialty fellowship training after residency, uh, won a sports medicine fellowship in Colorado, and then uh, I spent some time in Europe doing some orthopedic trauma as well. So after that, I um, ended up practicing in Janesville uh, since October of 2014, and then more recently, at the beginning of January of 23, uh, myself and 11 other partners form the Orthopedic and Spine Centers of Wisconsin, um, which is a private orthopedic practice based out of Madison, but we serve the greater Madison area and a number of hospitals, including Edgerton Hospital here in Edgerton, Wisconsin. So today's event, uh, we did that little bit of an introduction. Um, we'll talk about uh, the shoulder joint anatomy. The shoulder is a uh, it's a very special joint in terms of motion, and so we'll talk about some of the, the special anatomic um, <clears throat> parts of the, the shoulder that make it special. Then we'll talk about some of the common causes for why patients have shoulder pain. We'll talk about what you can do about shoulder pain, and then we can open it up to question and answer. Obviously, you know, with a limited amount of time, we kind of hit on some of the um, more common issues with the shoulder. Um, but if anyone has any specific questions about anything else, we're more than happy to discuss that. Um, so like I said before, uh, my practice, I started in 2014 in Janesville, started with the Orthopedic and Spine Centers of Wisconsin. The, my main practice consists of um, primary shoulder, hip, and knee replacement surgery, so replacing the joints with metal and plastic. I also specialize in arthroscopic surgery of the shoulder and knee, which is basically minimally invasive surgery for the joints with uh, small cameras and small instruments uh, and small incis incisions. Uh, I also take care of um, general fracture care of anything from the shoulder to the hand and wrist, as well as anything from the hip to the ankle and foot. Um, <clears throat> and I see patients currently in Edgerton, as well as in Madison uh, currently. So we'll start off today talking a little bit about uh, the anatomy of the shoulder. So the shoulder is, a, is quite a complex joint. You can imagine, you know, if you compare the shoulder to your knee, your knee really only moves in one direction. It bends and straightens in, in one plane. The shoulder can move in, in multiple different planes. So you can put it above your head, you can put it out to the side, you can put your hand behind your head, you can put your hand behind your back. And so in order to accommodate all of those different types of ranges of motion, you have to have a very non-constrained joint. And the best way to, for anyone to imagine the shoulder joint is to kind of imagine the golf ball on a golf tee. So the, the ball of the shoulder joint, as you can see kind of in the schematic diagram down here, is a golf ball and the, the, the socket of the shoulder is kind of a shallow golf tee. And so <clears throat> when you have kind of a shallow or small socket, that allows a, a lot of motion to be uh, gained from that. And so um, the problems that arise from the shoulder, uh, we can kind of separate them into, into two, two separate categories. One is of the bone and the cartilage. Um, that would be classified as arthritis or it's maybe you fractured or broke the bone and that can cause pain and, and difficulty with range of motion in the shoulder. The other category can be uh, soft tissue issues around the shoulder. So in order to stabilize this ball on this shallow, small golf tee of a socket, you can imagine that you have to have a lot of soft tissue that surrounds that ball to keep it in place. And so the, the soft tissue that surrounds that ball consists of muscles. Uh, there's tendons, which attach the muscles to the bone. 
And there's also ligaments. A ligament is what connects bone to bone. And like we said before, there's also cartilage that kind of coats the joint surface that causes, that allows us to move our joints and our, our shoulder in a very frictionless manner. The, the main takeaway from this slide is that the shoulder is a very special joint. The shoulder moves in a lot of different ways. Um, and it's different from other joints in the body and the fact that um, <clears throat> there's a lot of soft tissue around the shoulder that um, needs to work in concert to allow the shoulder to function appropriately. So we'll talk about the bony anatomy first. Um, this film, or this picture on the right is an x-ray of a right shoulder. <clears throat> so this is as if sorry, a patient was standing in front of us. And this is on the, on the left side of the screen here is a cartoon diagram of what a, a shoulder looks like. So there's three bones that basically make up your shoulder girdle. Um, we'll start out with the ball of your shoulder joint. The ball of the shoulder joint is, is the top of your humerus bone. So this is the humerus bone here. You can kind of see with my laser pointer on the screen on the cartoon drawing. On the x-ray, the top of the humerus bone is the ball of your shoulder joint. <clears throat> you also have the scapula. The scapula is a fancy word for the shoulder blade. And the side of the shoulder blade is the cup of your shoulder joint. You can kind of see this small, shallow cup that's on the side of the shoulder blade here. And then across the top of your shoulder girdle is the collarbone or the clavicle. And so all three of those bones come together to make up your, uh, what we call the shoulder girdle itself. Um, the top of the ball is covered in cartilage and so is the cup. And we'll talk about you know, issues with the cartilage of the shoulder a little bit later. So this makes up the, the bony anatomy of your shoulder joint. Now uh, surrounding that bony anatomy, like I said before, are muscles. And there's a lot of muscles <coughs> that surround the shoulder itself. There's kind of large superficial muscles that you'll kind of see on bodybuilders. Those are kind of the muscles that we, we strengthen and cover the outside of the shoulder. But there's also smaller, deeper muscles within the shoulder that can cause pain within the shoulder. And one, of the, one layer of those muscles is the rotator cuff. So the rotator cuff, as we'll talk about a little bit later, are kind of a sleeve of muscles that surround the ball of your shoulder joint. And this is a schematic or a cartoon diagram of your, again, of your right shoulder looking at it from the front view. And this is kind of it flipped around looking at it from the back view. And you can see the, the pink structures on this schematic diagram are muscles. The white structure that connects the pink to the bone is a tendon. And we'll talk a little bit more about what the rotator cuff is and, and how it functions later on in the, in the, in the presentation. But this is just a, a schematic diagram showing how much soft tissue uh, kind of surrounds the shoulder to kind of stabilize the ball in that socket. So as you see here, there's three rotator cuff muscles on the top of the shoulder, one in the front. There's also this biceps tendon that sits inside the shoulder joint as well. You can kind of see it takes us 90 degree turn. We'll talk about that a little bit later as well. Um, and then this is a, a schematic of the, the back of the shoulder. Again, you can kind of see these uh, rotator cuff muscles inserting on the, on the back of the ball of the shoulder joint. So we'll talk about you know, uh, these different um, aspects of common causes for shoulder pain today. And uh, I kind of picked out three or four of the most common uh, issues. The first one that we're going to talk about today is something called frozen shoulder. And you may have heard of this term with, um, from some of your friends or uh, neighbors may have, have had an issue similar to this. Um, so before we kind of get into the, 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 the topics of what frozen shoulder is and all the other causes of shoulder pain, I wanted to really quickly you know, go over what entails a, a visit to an orthopedic surgeon's office to get evaluated for shoulder pain. So the first things we, we do when, when a patient comes in to, us, to the office is we get a history. We talk to them about, number one, how long has your shoulder pain been going on for? Is this something that happened overnight? Is this something that occurred from an injury? Um, when does it bother you? How does it affect your life? Um, what type of pain is it? Um, and then we also ask about what type of treatment options you've had before. What has helped? What hasn't helped? Then we'll go on to a physical exam. We'll actually examine your shoulder, try to figure out what's causing the pain. Um, the majority of the time, almost always, we'll get a set of x-rays when you see us in the office first. Uh, and then other advanced imaging can be helpful. MRI is one modality that we use quite a bit of. Not every single patient needs an MRI, but you know, sometimes after we do the exam, after we do the x-rays, if there's a suspicion that 
something else is going on that we need to further evaluate, then we will get more advanced imaging in the form of an MRI, and, and sometimes a CT scan is, is necessary. So that's just a, a brief overview of what happens if you were to see us in the office. Um, so we'll start out with uh, frozen shoulder. The fancy word for, for frozen shoulder is adhesive capsulitis. Um, what is a frozen shoulder? A frozen shoulder is basically a very stiff and painful shoulder. And what happens in a frozen shoulder is every joint in the body is surrounded by a joint capsule that kind of keeps, whether it's the ball and the socket kind of in place and stabilizes the joint. And in the shoulder, for whatever reason, we're not, some, some of this we don't, we're not really sure why, but that joint capsule undergoes this inflammatory process that goes unchecked. So the inflammation kind of continues and continues, and that joint capsule becomes very inflamed, very irritated, and very thick. What happens when you have a very inflamed and very irritated joint capsule surrounding a joint is that the motion goes down. So you cannot move your shoulder above your head, you can't move it out to the side, and it becomes very, very painful. Um, so what causes frozen shoulder? Um, sometimes frozen shoulder can arise without a specific cause or reason. Uh, we do know that it's more common in, uh, as the older we get, so more common in the ages of 40 to 60. Uh, we do know also that it's more common in females than in women. Uh, and also diabetics, uh, for, for some reason, are also at a, a higher risk to develop a frozen shoulder. So this schematic or cartoon diagram on the right is just a cartoon of a right shoulder. This is um, a shoulder with a, of a joint capsule covering the shoulder. And you see on the left-hand side of the screen a, a normal shoulder with a normal joint capsule. In a frozen shoulder, that joint capsule gets very contracted, very inflamed, very irritated. And you can imagine if that joint capsule is kind of connecting the ball of the socket, it's not going to allow you to, to move that shoulder. And so the stages of a frozen shoulder are pretty predictable. You know, the first stage of a frozen shoulder is something called the freezing stage, and it goes through three pretty classic stages. And so the first stage is called a freezing stage, and the, the freezing stage is characterized usually by the gradual onset of increasing shoulder pain with some loss of motion. And so patients will have pretty, pretty significant pain. They might have, they might state that, you know, their motion has been getting worse over the last six to maybe 12 weeks. Um, and then after that phase, you go on to a frozen stage. So in, a, in the frozen stage, the pain actually is somewhat improved, but the range of motion is, is, is significantly limited. And so patients will say, you know what, my pain is improved, but I still cannot raised my arm and I didn't have the range of motion that I had before. And then patients go through a thawing phase where there's a gradual improvement in pain and motion um, with some mild stiffness that might be left over. And so the, the, the unfortunate thing with frozen shoulder is that, you know, the, the, actually the good thing about frozen shoulder is that most patients do not need any surgery for frozen shoulder. Patients will go through these three phases um, pretty predictably, but the unfortunate problem is that <laughs> to go through all these things, sometimes it can take 18, 18 months, uh, like a year and a half to kind of, to, to, for it to resolve on its own. So this is a picture, an arthroscopic picture of a shoulder, a normal shoulder. You can kind of see the cartilage on the ball and the socket is white. This is a soft tissue in the front of the shoulder here. Um, in an inflamed and irritated shoulder that's got frozen shoulder, you can see here all that red and inflamed tissue, it's kind of contracted as well. That causes the stiffness and pain in a, in a frozen shoulder. So good news about frozen shoulder is that the majority of cases um, of frozen shoulder do not need surgery. Um, every once in a while there's a patient that has, you know, gone on with conservative management and is not satisfied with the result of that and every once in a while you will need to have surgery but it's very uncommon to treat a, sh a frozen shoulder with surgery. Uh, the majority of the time a, a focused physical therapy program with a physical therapist is, is quite helpful. Uh, cortisone injections inside the shoulder joint which is basically a, a large tablet of ibuprofen or a steroid inside the shoulder joint where the problem is can be very effective in decreasing inflammation and helping with pain and improving range of motion. Um, but like I said before, you know, frozen shoulder can be a frustrating thing to deal with for the pa from a patient standpoint because, yes, it will get better without surgery, but you have to have patience and it can take, you know, up to a year, even two years for that to improve. Um, so, uh, we talked about frozen shoulder, which is basically a stiff, painful shoulder that, you know, that occurs in patients. 
Um, now we'll talk about the, the bursa, which is, you know, we've heard, I'm sure people have heard of bursitis. So we'll talk about what the subacromial bursa is. So number one, you know, you know, the first question that needs to be answered, what is a bursa? So a bursa is a fluid-filled sac that sits uh, between bone and skin or between uh, a bone and a tendon. And so we have multiple bursa sacs all throughout our body. Some of the more common bursa sacs to get inflamed or irritated, there's a bursa sac in front of our knee. There's a bursa sac on the side of our hips. There's also a bursa sac on the end of our, the point of our elbows. Uh, but there's also a bursa sac that sits just above the rotator cuff inside deep within the shoulder, within the shoulder joint. And so this is a cartoon diagram again of a, of a right shoulder, so a ball socket. This is the, on the right side of the screen is the shoulder blade. This is the top of the humerus, which is the ball as we talked about before. The roof of the shoulder, which is a part of the shoulder blade, is called the acromion. And below this, this piece of bone here sits the rotator cuff. And so the body's function of kind of lubricating the tendon by not rubbing up on this piece of bone is creating a fluid filled sac or a bursa sac that sits in between the bone and the tendon. And so this, this bursa sac right here is called the subacromial bursa. Sub meaning below, acromial meaning this bone. So uh, the bursa sac that sits below the, the acromion is called a subacromial bursa. Now, any bursa sac in the body can get inflamed and irritated uh, from chronic issues or repetitive movements. And the same can be said about this bursa sac that sits on top of the shoulder. And so um, why do patients get you know, uh, bursitis? You know, they can get it from repetitive use of the arm. They can get it from bad or poor mechanics when they're using their shoulders and when they're lifting objects. Um, so the symptoms of bursitis and um, subacromial bursitis can be very similar to issues with the rotator cuff. And so patients oftentimes will complain of pain with repetitive overhead activities when they're getting objects above their head. They'll talk about pain at nighttime that wakes them up from sleep, which is a pretty typical complaint from patients. Uh, they'll also state that they'll have difficulty with lifting objects away from their body. Um, and like we said before, the, these symptoms can be very similar to rotator cuff pathology or rotator cuff tears. Um, so the, the treatment options for subacromial bursitis, uh, which is very similar to a lot of the treatment options for many of the things that we'll talk about later on in the, in the talk, but the easy things that most patients can do are starting with anti-inflammatories. Aleve ibuprofen has been very beneficial to treat you know, chronic inflammatory problems throughout the body. Activity modification, so modifying activities that cause pain in your shoulder can be uh, quite helpful. Uh, physical therapy is a mainstay of treatment uh, for a lot of shoulder issues, so working with a physical therapist to work on strengthening certain muscles around the shoulder and also changing the biomechanics of how your shoulder uh, works. Um, and sometimes a steroid injection can be quite beneficial as well to decrease you know, inflammation and decrease pain uh, in that bursa sac. Uh, so certainly patients who have tried all these non-operative managements and um, failed to respond to these, these, these treatments can be candidates for surgery. And the surgery that we do basically in, in the operating room is we put a small camera into that bursa sac and shave down the bone that sits on top of the, <coughs> the rotator cuff. So you can see here on this diagram, we'll put a camera and instruments in this bursa sac and just kind of clean up that bursa. And also we can sometimes, patients will have a little bit of a bone spur on the top of their shoulder and we'll just trim down that bone spur and that can uh, be a very effective treatment options for alleviating pain from shoulder um, bursitis or another word for it is shoulder impingement. So we talked about frozen shoulder, we talked about you know, bursitis, which is a fluid-filled sac that sits on top of the rotator cuff or above the shoulder there. Now we'll talk about the rotator cuff uh, tendon, which is uh, one of the more common causes for shoulder pain as we get older. So many people have heard of what the rotator cuff is or they've heard their friends talk about, you know, I had rotator cuff surgery, but a lot of patients don't even know what truly what the, the, the rotator cuff is. And so, what is the rotator cuff? The rotator cuff is basically a group of four muscles that kind of surround the ball of your shoulder joint in a cuff of tissue. And so there are, this is a schematic diagram of a, a right shoulder again. 
So there's three muscles that sit on top of the ball of your shoulder and that muscle attaches to the bone through a tendon and there's one muscle in the front of your shoulder. And so those four muscles together um, encompass the rotator cuff. And this is the, the technical name for all four of those rotator cuff muscles. And this is another schematic kind of a cartoon diagram of a, of a right shoulder as if you're looking at it from the side view. And so you can see these three muscles that kind of sit on the top of the, the, the ball of your shoulder joint, and then there's one muscle that sits in the front of your, your shoulder joint. So those muscles act, number one, to power the shoulder with above, uh, above head activities, but it also kind of uh, compresses that ball in the socket and acts as a kind of a fulcrum point so the ball can rotate off the socket of your shoulder joint. And this schematic diagram on the right is a tear in the rotator cuff. So you could imagine if, if the muscles that are pulling on the ball are out of sync because one is torn, that can cause, lead to, you know, um, changes in your shoulder mechanics and a lot of weakness within the shoulder itself. So what does it do? It, um, we talked about it, it, it provides strength in certain movements, particularly in uh, motions away from the body and rotating the arm out from away from the body. Uh, one of the, the essential um, functions of the rotator cuff, as we just mentioned before, is to center the ball in the socket of the cup of the shoulder joint to provide a mechanical advantage for other muscles around the shoulder to work. So as you can see here, this is kind of a, a cartoon diagram with the muscles stripped away and then the muscles on top of it. You can see how those muscles are kind of pulling that ball into the socket and so it, it provides a fulcrum or a fixed point for the, the ball to pivot off of. Now if you have an injury to these muscles and you don't have a rotator cuff anymore surrounding the ball and all those muscles are gone, there's no fixed point <clears throat> for that ball to rotate off of. That can lead to um, difficulty with range of motion, a lot of weakness, um, and it also can lead down the road with chronic rotator cuff tears. It can, it can lead to arthritis. So symptoms of a rotator cuff tear, you know, pain on the outside of the shoulder. Uh, oftentimes patients will complain of pain you know, towards the side of the shoulder. Um, they'll complain of weakness with lifting. Um, they'll also state that they'll have a lot of pain at night times that wakes them up from sleep, which is a very common symptom of uh, shoulder pain. Um, so why do patients get rotator cuff tears? You know, you can certainly have a traumatic rotator cuff tear where, you know, I was playing basketball or I was playing some type of sport over the weekend and I fell directly on my shoulder and now I can't lift my arm over my head. That could potentially be a sign of a traumatic rotator cuff tear where it tears because of an injury. Uh, there are other patients who, as we age, we all have some fraying of our rotator cuff. And as you get older, sometimes that fraying gets to the point where the rotator cuff will tear off the, 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 the ball of your shoulder joint. Uh, it's also important to note, though, that a lot of patients as we get older, a lot of people as we get older, in normal shoulders will have rotator cuff tears. So if you look at some of the data, you know, patients with normal shoulders between the ages of 50 to 59, 13% um, of patients between 50 and 59 will have asymptomatic full thickness rotator cuff tears, meaning they'll have a normal shoulder that doesn't bother them, but they'll still have some aspect of a rotator cuff tear. And that number gets higher as you get older. So patients older than the age of 80, about half of those patients will have some aspect of a full thickness rotator cuff tear. So what does that mean? That basically means that you know, just because you have an MRI that was performed or if you've been told that you have a rotator cuff that's torn, doesn't mean it needs to be fixed. It's, uh, um, you have to have a discussion with your surgeon and uh, determine the appropriate treatment plan to figure out what exactly is causing your problem because the rotator cuff is just, as we discussed before, is only one cause for shoulder pain. There can be other causes for, for pain around the shoulder. Um, so the, the typical treatment for a rotator cuff tear, it differs between you know, uh, patients, but certainly in patients who have an acute tear from an injury or a trauma, a lot of those patients will ultimately ha need necessitate surgery. But if it's a chronic rotator cuff tear that has occurred over time, sometimes those patients can improve just with some physical therapy or with a cortisone injection and anti-inflammatories. Um, and if patients have gone through those, treat those conservative treatments, obviously surgery is always the last resort where we go in and, and fix the rotator cuff. Um, so since rotator cuff surgery is quite a common procedure that's, that we perform, that I perform, I figured we'd talk a little bit about 
you know, what the surgery entails and how we do it. Um, and so nowadays, you know, previously we used to perform rotator cuff surgery with somewhat of a large incisions where we make an incision on the shoulder and find the rotator cuff tendon and tack it down into the bone. But now we're able to do that same surgery arthroscopically, which basically means that we're doing it with small incisions and cameras. And so uh, what happens during a rotator cuff repair surgery is that if we had this tear that, of the tendon off the bone, we put this metal anchor in the bone that has sutures coming out of it. We pass those sutures through the tendon, as you can see here on this schematic diagram on the right. And then we just tie that tendon back down onto the bone. And that tendon ultimately heals onto the bone, and then you rehab the shoulder in terms of getting your range of motion and strength back. Um, the, the recovery from rotator cuff surgery, it can be a prolonged recovery process. Uh, in the first six weeks, we're kind of protecting the rotator cuff repair. So a lot of times in the first six weeks of your recovery, the physical therapist is moving the shoulder for you, um, and you're not moving it on your own. After that, you go through a gentle strengthening process that can last another six to 12 weeks. And then, you know, strengthening and slow return to activities can, can occur over the, the next three to six months from the date of surgery. So you, have, you do have to have some patience with rotator cuff repair surgery, but it is, qu it is quite a successful procedure uh, and it works uh, quite well in the right patient. Um, so how can we prevent injuries to the rotator cuff? Um, so avoiding repetitive overhead activities with large and heavy weights is one way to protect your shoulder. Any type of activity where you're lifting ob objects away from your body puts a lot of stress across the rotator cuff. It puts a lot of stress across your shoulder. And so when you're lifting objects that are heavy, keeping your elbows close to your body can be very beneficial. And then any type of injury that causes severe weakness in your shoulder or any type of injury uh, which causes um, you to lose range of motion or lose function in your arm is certainly uh, a sign to be evaluated uh, by a medical professional to get um, x-rays and possibly uh, more advanced imaging to evaluate the rotator cuff and, and see if there is an injury to it. So we talked about those things, we talked about the rotator cuff, we'll talk about another tendon <coughs> that's um, uh, the biceps tendon which lives inside the shoulder joint which can be a cause for pain. And so this is a cartoon diagram of your biceps tendon of a right shoulder again. So this pink muscle is your rotator cuff. The biceps, as we all know, is kind of that Popeye muscle that sits in our upper arm there. And the biceps muscle is attached at the shoulder joint in two spots. So there's a short head of the biceps that attaches on this piece of bone here that's called the coracoid. Then there's a long head of the biceps that's almost like a spaghetti string-like tendon that sits in the front of the shoulder here. And it takes a 90 degree turn and inserts on the top of the cup of the shoulder joint deep within the shoulder itself. So you can imagine that tendon, like any other tendon in the body, can get irritated. And as that tendon takes this 90 degree turn uh, inside the shoulder and then insertions in that insertion point inside the shoulder, at any point along that tendon, that can get inflamed and irritated and can cause pain. This is another schematic of a left shoulder now. So you can see this biceps tendon sitting in this groove in the front of the shoulder. As that attaches inside the shoulder joint, that biceps can get ripped off inside the shoulder joint and can cause you know, mechanical symptoms in the shoulder and can cause persistent pain. The acronym for that type of injury is called a SLAP tear, S-L-A-P. It's an acronym um, that means superior labrum, anterior posterior tear, but it basically means that your biceps anchor has kind of become detached off the top of your shoulder joint. And again, this is a very common uh, injury, number one in athletes, especially overhead throwing athletes. But also this can be a common um, finding in patients as we get older, like we said. You know, uh, as we get older we can get rotator cuff tears. As we get older we can also get these uh, tears at the biceps anchor, which can be uh, a cause for pain. Um, so what are the symptoms of a, a biceps tendon issue, biceps tendonitis, or um, uh, a tear of the biceps tendon within the shoulder? Oftentimes patients will complain of pain in the front of the shoulder. Um, they may complain of pain after um, an injury to the shoulder. Some of the common injuries that can cause biceps issues are injuries where you fall directly on the shoulder, or if you have a traction injury where the ball kind of can get pulled out of the socket, that can cause a, uh, a, a biceps injury as well. Um, 
Treatment options for biceps injuries, as we talked before, you know, very similar treatment options to the other things that we talked about. So anti-inflammatories, you know, can be very helpful to decrease inflammation, help with pain. Um, modifying activities along with some physical therapy can be very effective with many other, other shoulder issues that we talked about. Uh, steroid injections can be beneficial. The, the, the steroid injection, um, like we said before, it helps with inflammation. Unfortunately, it does not cause any healing or promote any type of healing. So with any of these things that we talked about, um, the, the one problem with rotator cuff tears as well as with these biceps tears is that once that tendon or that rotator cuff comes off the bone and tears, unfortunately the healing capacity of our own body to heal that tendon back onto the bone without surgery is very poor. And so unfortunately, you know, that's why we end up having to do surgery sometimes for rotator cuffs because they, they don't heal, similar to these biceps tears that occur inside the shoulder. The surgical option for biceps injuries, you know, we, the surgical option is actually either repairing that biceps where it came from in young patients. So that's doing a slap repair or a biceps anchor repair. In some of our older patients that, that we've found that repairing the tendon back to where it came from leads to a lot of stiffness and persistent pain. And so in those patients, we just remove the, pri by the tendon from inside the shoulder. There are a couple of ways to do that. One is to just cut that tendon inside the shoulder. The other is to cut the tendon and then reattach it lower down. Either one of those procedures, um, from a functional standpoint, has no functional consequence to the shoulder, meaning does not contribute to decreased range of motion, does not de contribute to decreased uh, strength, it basically relieves pain from the biceps tendon, um, but it can cause a cosmetic bulge in the muscle, but it's only a cosmetic issue, it's not a, really a functional problem. Um, last thing that we'll talk about today is arthritis. So arthritis is incredibly common as we get older. You know, it can affect any joint in the body. Anytime there's cartilage in the body that's uh, in a joint, uh, that joint can become arthritic, and that's basically what arthritis is. So arthritis is basically a problem of the joint. And so what is the glenohumeral joint? The glenohumeral joint is basically a fancy term for the ball and socket joint of your shoulder. And just like any other joint in the body, the ball of the shoulder and the socket of the shoulder is covered in nice, smooth, slippery cartilage. And that's, those two smooth surfaces rubbing on one another allows you to have a frictionless environment to give you range of motion and to give you a pain-free shoulder. Once that joint surface becomes um, injured or um, wears away, once that thick layer of cartilage wears out with time or with an injury, that's what arthritis is. And so instead of having two very smooth surfaces rubbing on one another, you ultimately have two very rough surfaces rubbing on one another. Uh, and the best analogy I have for bad or significant or end-stage arthritis is like, is that you have two pieces of um, sandpaper rubbing on one another instead of two pieces of smooth um, surfaces rubbing on one another. And so you can imagine sandpaper rubbing on sab sandpaper causes a lot of inflammation, causes a lot of pain, um, and it can and is a lead to um, loss of motion um, and uh, persistent pain with activities. So again, what is arthritis? Arthritis, like, like we said before, <clears throat> it's inflammation of the joint. It's caused by degeneration of the cartilage lining of the shoulder that coats the, the ball in the socket. It leads to pain, swelling, loss of motion in the joint, um, and it can affect any joint in the body. Um, there's you know, three main types of arthritis that we talk about. Osteoarthritis is kind of the run-of-the-mill arthritis that, you know, that we all kind of get as we get older. Uh, inflammatory arthritis is another type of arthritis which basically occurs from uh, inflammation in the body. This can be from um, autoimmune issues like lupus, um, like rheumatoid arthritis is a very common one which is basically where your immune system kind of goes haywire and attacks your, the joint lining of your joints and then that affects any, every, and every, any, any joint in your body. Um, so inflammatory arthritis uh, there's also post-traumatic arthritis. So if someone has an injury to their shoulder as, at a young age, <coughs> over the years, that shoulder can kind of become um, arthritic as you get older. So this is an x-ray on the right-hand side of a left shoulder. You can see the, the top of the humerus is the ball of your shoulder. The side of the shoulder blade is a socket. Now, cartilage does not show up on an x-ray. Only the bone does. So this space that you see between the ball and the socket represents the cartilage in the shoulder joint in a normal shoulder on the left. On the right, you can see 
that space is totally gone, it's obliterated. There's no space between the ball and the socket. That bone is rubbing up on bone. Uh, there's no more cartilage left. The bone underneath has become uh, what we call sclerotic or white from all that friction and irritation in the joint. And this is a, a very significantly arthritic shoulder, basically on the, the left-hand side of the screen there. Unfortunately, you know, the problem with arthritis is that we do not have a cure for arthritis. And so we cannot give you a, an injection in the joint that will reverse the process of arthritis. So once someone has arthritis, unfortunately, it's a progressive process that gets worse with time. And so um, the treatment options, though, for arthritis, um, like we said before, with other things that we talked about, anti-inflammatories are beneficial, uh, modifying activities, um, <clears throat> steroid injections can be quite beneficial for arthritis, so a steroid injection that is placed directly within the joint of the shoulder can uh, help with pain, uh, help with um, uh, inflammation in the shoulder joint. The unfortunate problem with cortisone injections though is that they are a temporary fix, so <clears throat> they may help for three to six months, which is a great result, but ultimately sometimes that cortisone over time will wear out and you can get one every three to four months, but Unfortunately, once you get to the point where none of these options, these conservative measures are working, the surgical option for shoulder arthritis is replacing the joint. Similar to a hip or a knee replacement, we can replace the shoulder joint. And so, um, again, this is just a, uh, an x-ray version of a, a right shoulder with arthritis, so a normal shoulder. There's good joint space here with the, between the ball and the socket. There's a, you can see this nice space between the ball and the socket. On this right shoulder here, on the, on the right side of the screen, no more space between the ball and the socket. They have these large bone spurs on the bottom of the ball of the socket. So this shoulder on the, the right is um, severely arthritic with end stage arthritis. So patients who have failed you know, um, conservative measures in terms of their shoulder, uh, they would be candidates for shoulder replacement surgery. Uh, I tell patients that patients who are candidates for shoulder replacement are Patients who come to me saying, you know, I'm, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired with my shoulder pain. And it is what we call elective surgery. So I am never gonna tell someone that they have to have surgery. It's usually the other way around. It's uh, the patients telling me that, you know, my pain has gotten to the point where uh, I can't do my daily activities anymore. I can't perform my job. I can't um, participate in my recreational activities or sports like I used to. And that's when patients say, you know what, it's time for me to, to, to proceed to the next step, which would be surgery. And so there's two broad categories of shoulder replacements. We'll talk about some of the, both of these on the next two slides. Um, there's the anatomic shoulder replacement, which is basically where you cut, you replace the ball with a metal ball and you place the cup with a plastic cup. So the ball stays a ball, the cup stays a cup. That's called an anatomic shoulder replacement. And there's also a reverse shoulder replacement where you actually switch where the ball is and the cup is. And we'll, we'll show you some diagrams of what that looks like um, uh, on, the, on the next few slides here. So who gets which surgery? And so the, the, the determining factors really on who gets which surgery, it depends on the condition of the rotator cuff. And as we said before, as we get older, the older we get, the more damage there is to the rotator cuff. So usually older patients will will tend to do more reverse shoulder replacements for them because their rotator cuff has been torn or frayed or is no longer working appropriately. In younger patients who have an intact rotator cuff, those are the patients that get anatomic shoulder replacements. However, that's not to say one, uh, one can't be a candidate for either one as you get older. Um, so this is just a, an x-ray um, uh, representation of the different types of shoulder replacements. So, this x-ray on the left is a normal shoulder, ball, socket of a left shoulder. This is an anatomic shoulder replacement in the center here. So you can see here, we've cut the old ball off. We've replaced it with metal ball. On the cup side, we've put a plastic cup there. So in an anatomic, like we said, the ball stays a ball, the cup stays a cup. In a reverse shoulder replacement, we actually put the ball on the cup side. So you can see this metal ball now is attached to the old cup of the shoulder joint and we've taken the ball off the top of the humerus here and put a plastic cup. You see this metal tray, and there's a plastic uh, cup that kind of cups and uh, kind of uh, cups onto the ball uh, of this, uh, this new shoulder joint. So that's a reverse shoulder replacement. So 
The reason we do these shoulder replacements, these reverse shoulder replacements for patients who do not have a rotator cuff is this changes the biomechanics of, of how the shoulder works. And it allows some of the other muscles, those large muscles that sit outside of the rotator, outside of the shoulder, the, namely the deltoid muscle, to give it a mechanical advantage to raise this arm above your head. And so that's basically why we, we have come up with this new shoulder replacement to accommodate for patients who do not have a rotator cuff. So again, uh, this is another x-ray of a left shoulder um, patient with significant arthritis that uh, had a anatomic shoulder replacement. So we cut the old ball off, put this metal ball where the ball was. Uh, we resurfaced the, plastic, the, the cartilage in the cup and we put a plastic cup where the, the um, old uh, cartilage was on the cup side. So that's an anatomic shoulder replacement. <clears throat> this is a kind of a, a sh an x-ray progression of a patient who has previously had a rotator cuff tear. And so on the left side of the screen, you can see there's pretty reasonable cartilage here. There's good space within the joint. As we go farther along to the right on this shoulder, this patient has gone on to re-tear their rotator cuff. Um, you can see the space between the ball and the roof of the shoulder there is, is essentially gone. Now this space right here is where the rotator cuff used to live. Now, if there is no more rotator cuff there, what happens is this ball starts to migrate up. The, the cartilage between the um, ball and the socket starts to wear away. The ball also starts to rub up on the, the bone on top, the acromion there. This is a patient who's got no functioning rotator cuff with significant arthritis. And so if you were to do this anatomic shoulder replacement for this patient, that would not end well because the patient has no rotator cuff for this shoulder to function. And so what we do for these patients is a reverse shoulder replacement where we put a large metal sphere where the cup used to be and we put this stem with this plastic cup where the ball used to be and we flip things around. So this provides a mechanical advantage to the shoulder. Um, and the reason we do shoulder replacements is to provide pain relief and to provide uh, improvement in function. And so uh, that's what all, either one of these you know, shoulder replacements, whether it's an anatomic or a reverse shoulder replacement, provides the same you know, relief of pain and improvement in function. And so <clears throat> shoulder replacements these days that we do here at Edgerton Hospital, we can do them with um, custom or three-dimensional uh, guides that we get made. So every patient, you know, um, if we believe it's necessary, we'll get a three-dimensional x-ray of their shoulder so we can kind of have a surgical plan before uh, getting into the operating room. Uh, and soon enough, hopefully, we'll have robotic surgery for shoulder replacements, which is coming you know, um, along on the, on the horizon, but it's just not here yet. But that's kind of in the pipeline, certainly. This is just another schematics representation of some of the custom guides that we can make for, for patients uh, to place our implants in the appropriate position. So shoulder replacement surgery, you do them here at Edgerton Hospital. Um, the surgery itself is about a one to two hour surgery. We do it under a general anesthesia. Uh, with a nerve block, so that means the, your arm will be numb for the first about 12 to 24 hours after surgery, which gives you excellent pain relief. You get to go home the same day. Most patients are in a sling for the first you know, three to six weeks. You start physical therapy pretty quickly within the first two, one to two weeks to get your motion back. Uh, most patients by uh, eight to 12 weeks are doing pretty well and beginning to return to their, their normal daily activities. Um, in terms of uh, return to sport and return to um, some of their, their activities of daily living. So, um, like again, shoulder replacement surgery, it's quite successful. Uh, it's an incredible surgery and powerful surgery to relieve pain from an arthritic shoulder and to provide patients with improved function out of their shoulder and essentially give them their life back from a, a, a joint that has been causing them chronic pain for uh, a number of years. So. This is just some, uh, some other uh, information and websites that you can visit to get more information on uh, shoulder pain and uh, shoulder arthritis and also uh, shoulder replacement surgery. Um, that's our phone number if you'd like to call us if you're interested in scheduling an appointment just to get an evaluation uh, for your shoulder. Um, and so, hope you found that uh, useful um, and Happy to take any questions if anyone has any. I, I started having shoulder pain and um, I started taking SNS 
have to alleviate some of my symptoms and it's not helping, how long should I wait before um, seeking medical care? So the question is, you know, if you have shoulder pain and you've tried some of the easy things like anti-inflammatories, you know, how long should you wait before you see, seek medical care? Now, you know, I, I see patients in my office who've been dealing with, you know, chronic pain in their shoulder for many weeks, up to many months. You know, certainly if you have an injury to your shoulder um, and you have, you know, acute onset of pain, it's probably best to be seen sooner rather than later. Um, if this is something that's kind of an insidious onset, meaning it's, it's somewhat of a chronic thing that's, you know, crept up on you, you know, I would say if it's beginning to interfere with activities of daily living, interfering with your sleep, um, interfering with what you can do on a daily basis at work, I would say that would be um, a red flag to you to, to signal that that might be a time to, to begin to, to get a, an evaluation with, uh, uh, with either your primary care physician uh, as a first option or with an orthopedic surgeon, you know, just to get a set of x-rays and a ex physical exam to figure out and pinpoint what exactly could be a source for your symptoms so we can kind of come up with a treatment plan together to figure out um, how we could help you. All right. Well, thanks for coming, everybody. I hope that was uh, beneficial and uh, educational. And um, if there's anything else we can do for you, we'd be happy to see you here in, uh, in Edgerton.